Energy in America, Lou Pudirisi keeping the lights on in California. That's what we have uh, in Energy in America this afternoon at the Wednesday 3 o'clock block. Welcome, Lou. Nice to see your smiling face along the towpath. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, it's good to see you, Jay. And uh, I think this is a great topic for this evening or for this afternoon for uh, our uh, friends in Hawaii. Um, and actually, I, as a matter of uh, a sort of a, a little advertisement here on April, on uh, September 23rd, which will be too early in Hawaii, I suspect, from 11 to 1230, we're going to be doing a webinar on this very topic, open to the public, any interested parties, and uh, it will include the uh, former uh, well-known uh, regulator of the Dutch power system, the Indian power system. I'm hoping that Ed Randolph from the California Public Utility Commission, who's the director of their energy analysis division will join us. Uh, uh, Mac Pazir from EPRANK and Ash Shastri, one of our fellows. So I think it's gonna be a great session. We're gonna explore the kind of intersection of the regulatory framework and the policy framework for bringing uh, renewables into the power sector in a less disruptive fashion, so we say. Well, this is kind of a preliminary on that. And that yes. sounds very interesting. So if I do the math, 11.30 Washington time means 5.30 here in Honolulu. Yeah, it's but you're, early, it's you're an early riser. It's not a problem for you, but. <laughs> well, what, what's the, how do I find it? How do I get there? How do I sign uh, up? I'm pretty sure they sent you an invitation, but if not, I will make sure we'll send you one uh, first thing in the morning, you can circulate it to your audience if you like, or Great. just to go onto the Uprink website, they can find the invitation. So, okay, so. well, thank you for that. And a great program. And it's a great idea for a discussion today, uh, especially given all the trouble that the West Coast has had lately. Yeah, and before we get started, I, I wanted to divide this I don't really want to talk a lot about fire management, but we need to talk a little bit about this. And I'll give you a little bit of my, we can talk a little bit about, because part of this is not just incorporating renewables into the utility system. It's also about the grid and fire management, problems that places like Texas don't have. They have hurricanes and things like that, but they don't have, they don't have this particular problem. I do have an underlying hypothesis, which I, can, I don't know how to test, but I believe that when society gets obsessed with a specific issue, let's say like climate, and they pour all their intellectual and financial resources into this one issue, and they tend to forget about other things that are very important, like fire management or infectious diseases and things like that. So. I think that public policy needs a lot more balance and thoughtfulness on how we spend our money and our intellectual resources, brain power especially. We're You're not referring to the issue about uh, the obligations of the Western states to sweep the leaves out from under the trees, are you? Well, yeah, I mean, I think fire management, actually a colleague of mine, the late uh, uh, Bob Nelson, he and I were in the Interior Department, wrote a very uh, well-known book called A Burning Issue, in which he, uh, he made the, not just a claim, he had a lot of data that if you, and we'll, we'll look at this a little, let, let's go to the first picture. That's, I think it's a night time to do it. If you, <clears throat> this is US, uh, if you look at the next picture, this is the US forest area burn 1926 to 2017. If you were to listen to Governor Newsom, or candidate uh, Joe Biden or John Kerry, endless number of people, in this case, mostly on the left, the real problem, the reason the fires are burning California to the ground is because of climate. So I have two questions to this. One is, they've known about this climate problem for 20 or 30 years, right? They know about it. So if it's climate, uh, and they, they were spending all their time on renewable fuels, someone should have said, well, you know, if it's getting hot, maybe we should spend some money uh, keeping an eye on these forest fires. The other interesting thing is, is that we are not in a period of massive forest fires. 
that we have ex that we have not experienced in the past. In fact, if you go here and look back into the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, you can see that the forest area burn, U.S. forest area burn were massive amounts, right? In fact, if you go to California at the turn of the 19th century or the 20th century, 1900, you can see uh, uh, pictures of Yosemite and some of the national parks in which the vegetation is quite low. You're quite shocked. Where's all the, you know, all the vegetation? Well, massive fires used to roll through those areas on a routine basis. So we have a lot of issues here. One is, is that we move sometime in the 1930s, 40s to instead of controlled burns or letting the forest burn to try to conserve the forest, we began to limit logging and we did not spend, frankly, enough, particularly in California and the West, enough money, enough resources on forest management. And we also had um, a couple of things happening. One is we do had a lot of, a larger per percentage of the population began to come into this interface between uh, you know, housing in the woodland community, you might say, or the near wilderness community. And then we decided that although we wouldn't have these controlled burns, we also would not clear out the underbrush. We would limit logging. And so we have a prob we, we have the problem of uh, poor forest management. Who's we? I mean, there's been a whole discussion in the media lately about uh, these burning areas in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where most of it, two thirds of it is federal land. Yes. Um, so, I, I, so it isn't really the states, uh, although the state, the states would be the area where these um, residential, residential homes are, uh, you know, uh, bordering on, on the forest. But in the large forest areas that are burning now, that's mostly federal land. I think a, a big percentage of his federal land, and this has to do with the philosophy of the Forest Service and the pressure from large numbers of the environmental community, including the Congress, to limit logging, to limit the uh, management growth, you know, limit the management of the forest in a productive way, you know, so in a way that would limit these fires. I mean, I think it was very short sighted. Now, is that chart that you showed? Which I assume is uh, is from some economic or commercial. Uh... No, that is from the United States Forest Service. Okay, okay, it show it shows huge acreage burn back to what turn of this? Is it, I can't see the numbers, but it's it's well, some that, years ago. 1926, um, 28, 1930s, twenties and thirties. Right, and, and I'll bet in those days that would be four. Uh, well, before the WPA and all that. Uh, the, you know, the infrastructure organizations that Roosevelt created. Yes. But, and, a lot but, of the, and they had nobody to go out and fight the fire. Exactly. So. They just let them burn. And there weren't a lot of people living there, right? So yeah. they let them burn. But, but the does, does the chart also include what's happening now? Because what's happening now is, well, oh, can, what is it, within the last 45 or 60 days? Well, yes. But if you look at 2014, 15, 16, 2017, you can see it's about one fifth of the record. We might be up a bit now, but we're nowhere near the levels we had. I mean, you can argue that climate is contributing to this, right? Let's say you're, you're the, the king of California, right? And you decide you're going to take care of all the climate problems. So you're going to have all these renewable fuels. It's curious that everything, Cal we've spoken about this many times. It doesn't matter what California does. They are not going to affect the temperature in California, right? It's a wonderful demonstration project. So policymakers should have also been, if they believed temperatures were rising, why did policymakers not encourage the public or build coalitions or make the case to deal with these issues of uh, uh, warmer temperatures or more underbrush or how we deal with it. Of they, course, that, that also includes the federal government, which has most of this land. I'm not, I'm not excusing the federal government from this, but many of the problems in California are on, in California particularly, are on state forest lands. Well, I think you should uh, distinguish between the, and I know some of your charts uh, 
include, you know, the origins of the fires. Right. It's very interesting to see that. Uh, and Smokey the Bear right. yes. would, would like to see that too, because that, that's what he wants to, Let's he wants to get in on that and stop the fires from starting. However, yeah, that, the, what, I, what I understand from all the coverage lately is that it doesn't much matter how the fires started, but climate change has an effect on making it dry tinder and making the fire worse. Yeah, that, that may be the case, but the question is, if you were engaged in a program to deal with climate and you did not, I'm sorry, you did not take some measures of adaption, you put all your eggs into some wonderful experiment of renewables and you pretended that the adaption wasn't necessary, I'm sorry, you, you made a mistake as a policymaker. You should have been talking about adaption. You should have been talking about measures to protect the population. What's happening in California and what's happening all, you know how politicians are, and this is left and right, okay? I'm not, this is not, this is a bipartisan. They wanna blame PG&E, which is fine, but PG&E is a regulated utility. It is a regulated utility. It has very old grid lines, right? Why did they not invest in the grid, right? Why, did why, grid why, why should PGE have any responsibility about forests? Absolutely, they have none, they have none. But some of the, if you can see from the sources of wildfires here, right? If you look to the next chart here, sources of wildfires. Let's pull that up for a second. Uh, you can see here that in fact, about 8% of the fires are called caused by electrical power. 11% by lightning. I love this one, debris burning. Some guys out in the backyard, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Camp fires, playing with fires, smoking. And then in fact, it's funny, Smokey the Bear is only worth 1%. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so what, 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 how much would you attribute, uh, you know, in the way of fire starters to PG&E or utilities uh, on this chart? Well, if you look at this chart, now this is for the whole... Uh, That's the state of California, California, right? California, okay. California. 2015. Yeah. yeah, the electrical powers are part of it. But, you know, what's happening in California also is because in some regions, they are now having... Now, we'll get to that in a minute. They're having rolling blackouts. Some of the blackouts are because they are nervous that their utility poles, transformers, tr you know, the stations uh, may, uh, because they're old, uh, may have sparks or, or failures, which would create a fire. But very recently, some of the blackouts are occurring because they don't have enough power. When the, when the sun, is no longer shining and the wind stops blowing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if you, but if you have a wildfire and you yeah. have a transmission line, um, you know, going through that area and the fire burns the transmission line, you don't have any power going through that line. Right, I mean, you, but look, we live in a neighborhood where we have big storms occasionally and they, poles get taken out and lightning or big storm blows a bunch of trees down, but, you know, the crews come out and repair them or they reroute the power. It's not, it's when it happens on a larger scale, I think. Uh, but I think the point of this is politicians now are either pointing the finger at climate, but are pointing the finger at PG&E, but they are not pointing the finger at themselves. And they, they need. Uh, I'm glad you said politicians because when Trump went out there, he said, oh, this is a matter of managing the forest floor, which is, I mean, maybe I'm young and naive, but I never heard that one. Um, and I think he's trying, he's trying to uh, uh, point the blame at, at those three states. But in fact, if it's all or most of it is federal land, it's the federal government who failed to manage the forest floor. Well, I think we have a long policy of poor management by the Forest Service, but I'm almost sure many of these fires, most of them are on state forest lands or uh, even private lands, but state lands. I, I don't know, uh, except what I've heard in the media. The, the main areas where people live are not in the forest lands. You cannot build homes in the forest lands. That's true. 
in the Forest Service. You could only build them in wooded areas next to state parks or in the state parks or some areas or integrated among the state parks. So right. that's, but that, that's not to say that the, far, the fires here, the wildfires are limited to the areas in which people live. I mean, I think there are vast swatches of land that are not residential, which right, are federal, it, it, which are where the fires are burning. Right, but if a forest fire occurs in forest land and there's nobody living there, it's okay, it's bad, it's a lot of smoke, but it's not unusual as you can see by the previous chart, right? We used to have a lot of fires. In do, you, fact, do you happen to know, Lou, whether the federal government has put more or less money into forest, you know, forest management in the last few years? The, the Forest Service has been putting more money into forest management, but the one federal policy problem, one that really is more than Congress than anyone else, is the limited logging and uh, the environmental movement has been against wide scale logging, cutting of trees, a lot, and I think they're changing. Many of the environmental groups at the Sierra Club and others are saying, well, you know, we've overdone it on this stuff. We have to get in there and manage these forests better. These fires are not, they're more of a natural outcome. You need to have more controlled burn. You know, the, uh, the uh, Native American tribes used to have controlled burns all the time. On, on the logging, you know, I remember my wife and I did a thing uh, on bicycles called Bike Centennial back in the late 70s. We went, we went to the West Coast a couple of times doing that. And uh, in Oregon especially, uh, they had these logging trucks, yeah. huge lumbering, they were just huge with chains dancing along the pavement, you know, it was very threatening to people on bikes. Um, I, I, I haven't been there really since, I haven't ridden the highways, but query, the, the, are you saying that all that logging activity that we saw in the late 70s is, is gone or seriously diminished? It's diminished, and uh, yeah, I mean, there's all endangered species, spotted owl, lots of different uh, environmental constraints have limited the amount of logging in the West mm -hmm. on federal lands. I don't know that much about state lands, you know, how much logging is taking place, but I, I do think there has been a movement, even in the environmental community saying, oh, we overdid it. We lobbied, you know, we, we had a, we had the wrong model of the forest. We need a different model. We need a more, uh, you know, full cycle model of how the how you have a healthy forest, and the and and you can see that we used to have very big fires in the forest. You know, they weren't necessarily all bad. You know? And there's been a lot written about this. I just think the policy hasn't connected up with it. Mm -hmm. But I do think you know my main question here. My main point is that. If policymakers get fixated on a specific solution and they can't step back because of the lobbying groups and the uh, virtue signaling they need to do, we've talked about this with Hawaii, right? If you think about Hawaii, what should they, if they really think climate is a number one issue, how should they allocate their budget? Renewables versus adaption. And, you know, if you're Hawaii, you should be spending at least half your money, you know, some big percentage of your climate budget on adaption. What's adaption? Seawalls, uh, setbacks for uh, homes, uh, dealing with larger, you know, capacity to deal with larger storms. If, you, if you're if you buying into all this stuff, you should have a program for that. I when totally you, agree. I totally agree. And, and you, frankly, you don't see any money going there at all. Exactly. Because it's not sexy. It's not sexy. Okay. It's hard work and it's not, you know, no one says, why are you doing that? You know, I don't understand. That. Well, you wait until something terrible happens yes. and then you play the play, the blame game. Right. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> now I want to talk a little bit about, uh, what's going on in California a little bit of what right now, because we have, we've talked about the forest manager issue, but they are dropping load in California. And about a, 2017, then Secretary of Energy uh, Perry sent a note, sent a, a, a proposed rulemaking to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission saying that he sh that the commission should give extra weight in the management of utility systems and the rulemaking, however they do these things, to 
generating facilities which have reserve capacity. Now, it was a very ham-handed way. He said, well, they should have 90 days worth of fuel. He was trying to save coal plants and some nuclear plants, things like that. But in fact, Perry, although his approach to this rule, as, in, as, the, as the chairman of FERC said, well, the secretary's approach is really not appropriate. He did say we should study this issue because um, it is true that as you put more intermittent power into the grid, you impose other costs and constraints on it that are not well appreciated. And uh, I, I'm gonna take you through a couple of pictures here where we can talk about that. The first one is what, I think we've seen this before, but let's just look at it quickly. You can see what's happened to electricity prices in California between 2011 and 2017. You can see the next, the next picture here. And uh, you, as you can see here, even though California has adopted and brought into their utility system lots of a low cost wind and solar, right? Because we know it's low cost, right? Uh, the price of power in California has risen much faster than the average price of power to the rest of the US, right? And that, exclude, exclude Hawaii because we're really not on that chart. Right, we're, we're, we're above that chart. You're, you're an island. You're an island community, and you you don't really have uh, a lot of choice on what you do. I mean, you know, no. we're we're we're, we're a small player. Than anything you. on the lower <laughs> curve, but but why? But how do you explain the increase in California? Okay, so let's go to the next picture. So, as you, the Queso is the California Independent System Operator. And the system operator is supposed to integrate different kinds of uh, power generation system to optimize the performance of and guarantee its uh, reliability. And you can see here what's called this famous duck curve, right? Uh -huh. And as they put more- That's because it looks like a duck. Exactly. And you know what they say about that. <laughs> if, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, then it must be a duck. This is not a duck <laughs> because it doesn't walk like one. And you can see here that the uh, what happens is as you enter a lot of wind and solar, particularly solar, into the California system, the base load, the base load requirements begin to fall when the sun comes out and the wind blows. But what happens when the sun goes down? Well, the uh, the the need for large amounts of power are very, very high. But California was very reluctant to either maintain their base load, uh, you know, they, they've closed down one of their nuclear plants, their gas plants, and even the peaking plants. They had a vision of going to net zero carbon by 2050, right? And it's very funny because how they were gonna do that is that they would just buy the power from out of state. Sometimes it's hydro, sometimes it's gas. But they get within the state, you know, we are not burning any. We're not burning it, right? I love that, yeah. yeah. And the, the problem with this is that- Of course, uh, if they bought it from New Mexico, that might, that might be safer. <laughs> but the problems you can see is that when you get to around 5.30 PM, <laughs> you have a huge requirement for power. So I'm one of the things I've been talking to people, and we're gonna talk about this on the webinar with some of the regulators is, maybe the answer to this is if I am auctioning, and a lot of this is done with uh, auctions where people um, bid into the system, right? They make a bid to provide power, right? But perhaps what we should do to the renewable fuels like solar and wind is say, they must bid firm power. So it's, it's, it's important that if you're going to bid your solar number, which is like one, you know, a tenth of a cent, whatever, very low or even negative sometimes, right? You have to bid firm power. So you need to deliver that power in the middle of the night. And that way you say, well, how can you do that? I have a solar farm. Well, then you go get the batteries or you get a backup gas. But at least we get to see uh, what the real, what we call price discovery. We get to see what the price is. Sure, that makes a lot of sense. It's apples and apples. Right, if everybody's bidding firm power. Now, I don't know, I asked the chairman of the FERC about this. He said they were studying it, but I do think 
this is a thing we're going to talk about in our webinar with some of the regulators because this imbalance is a problem because when I'm selling you power from solar, it's not the same as when I'm selling you power from a nuclear plant because that power from the nuclear plant is not intermittent. It's not variable. That's it's fine. there 24 seven. That power from solar is variable. So it's not the same product. Mm -hmm. That's all we're saying. So, so I mean, the study is how are we doing on batteries in, in terms of price, efficiency, better, but, and know, whether they can be integrated with solar. We don't have enough battery power now to move up this duck curve more than about 30 minutes, okay? Well, it's true. I mean, if you look, for example, on Kauai, there's a huge solar yeah. farm on Kauai, but the batteries are a small part of it, and yeah. they, can't, they can't carry overnight, not yet. No, and no. so ultimately, these uh, solar farms are going to have to have bigger batteries or right. more efficient batteries. Right. But the, the main thing for our viewers here is just because something's just because someone says, oh, we have solar power and it's really cheap. Well, it's only cheap when the sun's shining. So they're not, it, we need to get this power system on an apples for apples basis in comparison. Yeah. What about now wind, it ought to be a better proposition, eh? Well, the wind stops blowing also, sometimes when the sun goes down, <laughs> often when the sun goes down. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I don't think it stops completely, but it, it slows no. down. And then part of the problem is if you were, see, see, one of the things we could get if people were bidding firm power is that we would get some creative ideas out of the solar and the wind guys. They would say, okay, I'm going to extend the grid from here to there. I'm going to uh, grab us power uh, farther away. Or we're gonna, and here's my bid, which includes all these other costs. At which point then it gets more interesting because we have real price discovery. And we, we might not get that cost of power rising so fast because we'd have a more, com a more competitive level playing field. Well, there's another thought here though, Lou, and, and that is um, granted that it, it costs more money to, to treat it as firm power, because then you have to spend more money on batteries oh, and oh. you know to make it firm. Yeah. On the other hand, an environmentalist would say, look, we're, we're trying to avoid carbon emissions. So if you're comparing uh, apples with, um, with coal or something that emits oil or something like that, um, we're happy to pay the additional amount because we, it, this is a public policy issue. We want to achieve carbon, you know, no carbon emissions. Uh, we want to avoid, you know, greenhouse mm -hmm. gases and we want to stop climate change, which is not being stopped at all right now. Seems to me that if you, if you had an, an, a, an environmentalist here, he would say, gee, it's not, it's not going very well. Trump denies it, rejects it, its whole government denies it and rejects it. Well, and I that mean, enters into the public policy and the regulatory uh, environment. So maybe that's why if you had a carbon tax, you could sort of deal with it that way. You know, you would, you would, you know, you could, you could make your bid. Some of your uh, fuel would be taxed because it has fossils. Some would not be, but disturbing the, you know, these kinds of disruptions to the grid are very costly. Think about it for a second. California is the fifth largest economy in the world. It's the home to all, to the, all the high technology giants. It's a, it's a highly prosperous, at least parts of it, highly educated community. And you're telling me they can't keep the lights on? I mean, what ha how do people feel about government if they can't keep the lights on? Absolutely. And, and that goes for so much infrastructure in right. the country. We have um, not, not a, Spencer Abrams was an energy uh, czar back in, I right. guess, in the uh, 90s or so. Yeah, right. uh, you must have known him or known yeah. of him. Yeah. And one time the Northeast, uh, you know, grid went down. I mean, a huge uh, geographical era, area went down all at the same time. And they said, uh, so uh, Spencer, what, you know, what happened here? This is terrible. Oh, aren't you watching the store? He says, you know, we built these huge infrastructures years ago when we started highways, bridges, dams, electrical grids and all that. And we have not attended to them. Yeah. We have not followed up. We have not spent the money to maintain and expand them, make them more efficient. And I think that goes for all infrastructure in the country. 
When Trump was elected, he said, I'm going to fix the infrastructure. And that is a noble cause, but we haven't done it. We have a lot of work to head for us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so let's, let's, uh, we have only, well, just seconds to go. Can, can you try to summarize this and uh, suggest what California can do um, to get into a better curve, or yeah, I, if, I, if, it, if it truly needs to do that, because as I, as I, I, think I said, I, I don't think there's any doubt they underinvested in the grid, safety of the grid. There's no doubt about that. They, I believe that from a public policy point of view, they got narrowly focused on these mandates to hit certain generation targets, and they didn't have a systems approach to this problem. And this systems approach goes all the way back to fire management to the integrity of the grid, to reducing the probability of dropping load. And it's a kind of shocking that a very rich state like California got into this problem. And I think they got into this problem because a lot of technical issues that they should have addressed were overwhelmed by feel good political goals. That's my... That's my working hypothesis. Okay, well, let me let me uh, ask you one last question, which I can't resist asking you. Uh, is this problem you're describing uh, limited to California? Because there are other states which have I targets of 100% renewables. Uh, well, the same I think, process is happening elsewhere. No? I think you should, uh, we are beginning a big uh, study on this issue because clearly some parts of the world or some parts of the US do a much better job of incorporating renewables than others. Texas, for example, has lots of wind and solar, but they're not dropping load, you know, because they've spent money on the grid and other things. So there are lessons for California. I think one of the lessons, if you can see the last chart here, is that you know, you don't get fixated with a mandate. Your you know, your operating objective should be to provide power that's as clean as possible, as cheap as possible, and as reliable as possible. If you just try to provide power that's as clean as possible, and you forget about those other objectives of the power system, you're going to have some unhappy customers. So one, one last thing, look, I, that's the most interesting chart to me, the one you just showed, Lou. The most interesting one because it shows not only that there are some states that you know have goals to reach renewables by 2045 2050 whatever they're the ones in the dark colors it's really <laughs> interesting but the but the overarching point of interest for me is a they're only in the west the ones yeah. that have serious goals and b well, there's differences there's differences around the country lou shouldn't this be federal Shouldn't this be a national initiative? Why is it not a national initiative? So I happen to think, Jay, that that is a much longer discussion about the founding fathers and why we have a why we have a democratic republic and not a direct. <laughs> Good answer, man. <laughs> well, thank you, Lou. It's a great discussion today. As always, really it's great to see you. Just I... send me a postcard when I can come and visit you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you may have to. Ask him if I can come and visit, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll make a call. <laughs> Please, I know you know him personally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Lou Pugliarisi, uh, the CEO, president of ePrink, uh, and uh, having going to have a great program on this very subject yeah. about California and its power grid uh, coming up in October. Thank you so much. Take care, Jay. Bye. Aloha. <laughs>